Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Vogt-Turner. I'm a author and a lay theologian. Today's presentation title is called Soil Health and Biodiversity with Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage, CCUS. The assumption coming out of the COP26 is that all future electrical sources must be renewable. What many may not realize is that CCUS abates coal and fossil fuel emissions. But at COP22, at COP26, more than 40 countries have taken the power past coal pledge. This perception is causing government and environmental divestment and may leave poor African countries dependent on popular or COP26 solutions. One in two people in sub-Saharan Africa have no electricity. Electrification of farm vehicles and tractors may not be possible now or in the near future. CCUS provides sustainable alternatives for poverty and eco-justice. So people can push past the COP26 assumption. In this pre presentation, I show four videos and one podcast to discuss and demonstrate how CCUS abates emissions and contributes to soil health and biodiversity. The first two demonstrate waste management programs, the first in Addis Ababa and the second in the UK. A podcast coming out of Australia sets up the third video to demonstrate carbon farming, how greenhouse gas is captured to enhance the soil. The fourth video stresses the need for wise mining, especially sand. Lastly, I lift up a success story coming out of Saskatchewan, Canada of abated coal power. Here's the first video. Rapid Waste to Energy works by taking in the garbage, keeping it in a bunker for about five days to allow the moisture to sip, and then burning it at about a thousand degrees centigrade, turning that into heat energy that is then able to move steam turbines um, that in turn generate electricity. Simultaneously, we're able to capture what would have been pollutant gases and turn them into inert materials and make sure that there is no major pollution from uh, the facility. The impact is five million people are breathing much better air a significant amount of methane that would have gone into the environment is averted. It has real impact that you're able to feel uh, because this is air, toxic air that you have been breathing. taking this, this much garbage with almost a total of 500 million kilograms of garbage uh, for the whole year. Now, you don't have to dump that in new landfills. That is land now that could be used for constructing housing, uh, doing other projects. We have precious land that is now kept out of being a storage for garbage forever. Because once you've used a landfill, even if you cap the landfill, there is land that is no longer valuable and, and usable to the community. So in cities like Lagos and Dakar and Abidjan and Nairobi, you have landfills, open dumping sites that are similar to Repi. 
that are causing a significant amount of damage to the environment, to underground aquifers. And we have added even additional modern technologies that are able to come hand in hand to generating electricity. And these are, for example, projects like insect farming, where we are able to channel the additional amount of food waste that is coming in to be able to capture the food waste, feed in black soldier flies that, are, that grow, so as soon as they hatch from an egg stage, that grow 10 times their weight within 10 days. And we're able to capture them and turn them into uh, chicken feed and fish feed that farmers are able to use. That reduces the amount of uh, chicken feed that you need to grow um, that has been competing with human food. The challenge for the fertilizer industry is the fact that we have a very carbon intensive technology which is vital for growing food. But also we know that world leaders have now accepted the fact that we are behind the eight ball and we need to catch up fast. Fertilizer production globally is broadly the same. Really they are using processes that are about 70 years old. Non-organic fertilizer has a huge carbon footprint. We need to reduce the emissions coming from the energy and industrial sectors if we are to reach net zero. CCM's technology captures carbon dioxide and other waste streams and either stores the captured material or converts it into resources like fertilizer or plastics. I'm going to borrow the quote from Mahatma Gandhi, waste is only a resource in the wrong place. That is the core tenet to what we do. I'm Pavel Kishlevsky, Chief Executive of CCM Technologies. Well, we have a fairly strange origin in the fact that Professor Peter Hammond and I were parents at the same school. My background is finance, his is a chemical engineer, and it was the combination of those two skill sets that founded the company back in 2011. When Peter and I founded the company, his intellectual property, which he's been developing over 25 years, is around CO2. But interestingly, he was looking at it as a solution for some of the engineering challenges that he was solving for big companies. And he turned his mind to suddenly realize that actually there was a way of capturing the CO2, the devil incarnate, and actually using that for a profitable and sensible method. It's got to be better, it's got to be as easy to use, and it's got to be cheaper. And we've appreciated that from, from the beginning. There was a sort of circularity developing in the whole process and that led on very rapidly to us appreciating that if we could take materials from their end of life within waste and actually reintroduce them to the beginning of the cycle, that would be a really good process. Conventional nitrogen fertiliser production in particular is very energy intensive. In some cases, four, five, six, seven tonnes of emissions of CO2 for one tonne of fertiliser whereas our materials are neutral in that sense. CCM is able to produce fertilizers with a zero carbon footprint or even potentially climate positive, i.e. it's removing carbon from the atmosphere. The equipment you can see behind us is relatively straightforward. It's a mixing and blending technology that is around really three inputs. Those are fibrous materials, any sustainable source really. So grass, straw, wood chip or digestate cake ammonia, which is recovered either from food or animal waste streams. Then carbon dioxide, which is generally recovered in our case from exhaust streams. And it's those three components which are currently considered waste that we can turn into something that's both valuable and also good for the environment. Wastewater is a very good example. But at the moment, they are discharging phosphorus and ammonia into the groundwater. So rather than have them as a waste, 
recycle them back in and use them as the core nutrients to build fertilizer with zero carbon footprint. The key part of CCM's process is to deliver the farmer a fertilizer he actually wants and needs. So it's customizable to its nutrient ingredients. We have a solution that can be put to the rice crop, to the largest crop in the world, but also sub-Saharan Africa as well, where clearly soil temperature is a big issue. We're also putting both organic matter and carbon in the form of calcium carbonate into the soil. So we're putting it back where it started from and closing the cycle. Another of Peter's real tenets is to ensure that the price point of the product is at least the same as the current environment, if not slightly better. Then you can actually mobilise agriculture as a massive tool in fixing the environment. We have to create a better climate and a better world for my grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren. Agriculture is using a range of finite resources which will run out our process will allow the extension of those finite resources but also in recovering them from waste materials it actually creates a new resource base but without changing the fundamental ways in which you deliver agricultural production. Coal is actually about two-thirds water, and all that water is hidden in micropores, which you don't really see. So you're picking up a piece of material that's really more water than anything else. So you know, this idea of um, burning wet coal to boil water and make steam is very energy inefficient. We need to do something completely different if we want to still use the coal. It's not really all that bad news because really, you know, as far as burning coal is concerned, it was a terrible fuel in the first place. So. What else could we do? And uh, if we think about the properties of it, it's full of water, it's very porous, and it's got lots of oxygen in it. So it makes it much more chemically reactive feedstock than what you could do with a black coal. And so there are other alternative uses much more suited to brown coal, and one of them could be hydrogen. Hydrogen is really the new flavour of the month, and the whole idea is can we actually develop a hydrogen economy in the near future? It might sound really strange because it's counterintuitive to say that brown coal, even though it's a lousy fuel, it could power a hydrogen industry. So let me explain why that would be possible. So we still want to use the energy in the coal to make hydrogen, but it's not like there's hydrogen in the coal. Hydrogen is something that isn't available on the planet. It's the most common element in the universe, but on Earth we have to make it. It's a product we have to manufacture, and that needs a lot of energy because we get the energy back when we oxidise or burn it, but you have to start off with a lot of energy to make it, and we make it from water. Water's the key ingredient. You need like nine kilos of water to make one kilo of hydrogen. And that water is pretty scarce around a lot of Australia. So we need to think really, well, what could we do? You know, the brain might be ticking already. We know coal is full of water, and water is a scarce resource in Australia, so that's actually a big tick, the fact that it's wet. At the moment, the cheapest way of making hydrogen is from natural gas. And what we want to do here in the HESC project is actually turn brown coal into gas. And that gas then can be the source for the energy to turn water into hydrogen. And the issue here is I think that a gasifier is a far more thermally efficient way of using the energy in coal than a boiler is. So we've got that big tick there as well. And the water, we know we need lots of it, and it's already built in. The coal's got a built-in water supply for us to use. But the killer is going to be greenhouse gas emissions. There's no point making a zero emissions fuel if you have to create a lot of CO2 to do it. So how would we manage that in uh, Gippsland? And this is probably one of the key drivers We've got the opportunity with carbon capture and storage, you might have heard, CCS. A lot of people think that's just rubbish, it doesn't work, but honestly, you just have to look at all the commercial plants that are working with this sort of technology, with gas plants, and even coal plants are, are getting into this technology now. It is going to be part of the mix, it's not the whole solution. Yes, think of that brown coal as a chemical, not a fuel. One of the highlights of my science career has been actually working in a team that commercialised making humate products out of brown coal. And currently, like, there's hundreds of thousands of litres of these humic system products coming out of the valley every week. And we export those not only to, like, the almond growers on the Murray or whatever, they go internationally, they go to India, they go to Brazil, and they help grow more food for people and get the price down for food. 
So that whole idea of these biostimulant properties is something that we really want to fine tune in the work that I'm doing now. So we're working on a new generation of these products made from the humic coal, if you like, the brown coal, to improve food and fibre production even more. So they'll be higher value and easily you know, more exportable. So there really is a bright future for brown coal as a world-class humic resource. It has competitive advantages in manufacturing large-scale climate-friendly hydrogen agri-products. And I'll finish and wrap up by saying Victorian brown coal isn't dirty. It's a very valuable kind of dirt. Thank you. Here we are in the nursery and are going to use um, these seedlings as a way of um, explaining what we think is happening. So the sunshine is promoting photosynthesis within these leaves. While the photosynthesis is running, it is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it is actually exuding or spitting out oxygen. It's part of the oxygen and the carbon dioxide cycle. Now, that is built, so it's turning, or it's turning atmospheric carbon dioxide into plants, into plant, into leaf. Now, what we've noticed and what we suspect is with the emissions is it is actually stimulating photosynthesis to be more efficient. And as the photosynthesis is, is more efficient, the sugars that the leaves are making to provide power for the plant, some of them are actually going now down into the root. And what we see and what we suspect is the roots are exuding sugars into, into the soil and that is what is feeding the soil life. This farmer has chosen to actually spray his solubilised emissions over the top of his crop. And as you can see, you can see that brand new shining tank where the diesel emissions are bubbled through and they extract the nanotubes, the soots and the nitrous oxides. So here we are on the fields, the plains of Canada. This is a state-of-the-art machine. They are taking the emissions, as you can see, and they're being bubbled through water. This captures the nitrous oxides, the soots and nanotubes from the diesel emissions, and then they're injected with the planter into the soils. Innovation across Canada, Australia, has led to this basic idea being used and applied more and more usefully for farmers. These farmers do not use fertiliser. These crops are fertiliser free. So with this, this technology that you see on this big tractor here, when you, this, this itself is $70,000, which is a very expensive machine and it's, 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 uh, it's been an expensive learning curve for us. But without us learning from this piece of machinery, we couldn't consolidate this very expensive technology down to the 75 horsepower tractor without it. But what we've done is we've also been able to scale down the cost of the exercise because by learning from here we've been able to introduce the solubilizing uh, aspect to the tractor which has um, improved the, the heat exchanging that we need to do to cool these big tractors down. But by introducing that we've scaled the manufacturing down so that on a 75 horsepower tractor, it costs you $9,500 instead of $70,000. So it has brought the economies of scale into that sector that was unaffordable. But if we didn't do these, uh, the, these modifications and if we didn't learn from what we did with this, we wouldn't have been able to bring that product to Africa, that small, uh, small tractor product for an affordable price. And uh, it can be repaid I believe in four years, the whole carbon kits, including the bioactive, including the tractor and the planter. And we want that to not be a burden on the entrepreneur. We want the entrepreneur to work hard for four years, pay it off, and then go forward with a good piece of machinery for another good, good 10 years of service and make a good solid business out of it. And so all this education, all this learning, pain and suffering and gray hair that I have has produced that product. And that's what's important uh, in bringing this agricultural sector forward. Here we are now in Mozambique. Uh, the crop is cotton. You can see the tractor engine emissions are bubbled through the water in the solubilizer at the front of the tractor. At the rear of the tractor, you can see the basic drill is ripping into the soil. 
and they're placing the cotton seeds into the rip and spraying the solubilized emissions onto the drill line. You can now see the pipes dosing newly planted cotton seed with these solubilized emissions. And the ripping tines are opening and softening the soil below the seeds. The solubilizer at the front of this tractor is doing exactly the same job. It's putting emissions through water which are then injected above the rows where the seeds are planted. This is sorghum and this is in Tanzania in heavy soil. It's the beginning of a story of carbon farming. The roots are now well established in the sorghum crop and the plants are away. The plant is sucking in carbon dioxide through their leaves for photosynthesis to make sugar. These healthy plants may exude up to 20% of their sugars through their roots. This is feeding the soil life. With no fertilizers added, there is now a natural root environment. It has not been made salty or polluted by the addition of artificial fertilizers. And the soil is beginning to live the way nature intended. The sands of time, millennia in the making, just decades in their destruction. The sands of time are running out. 50 billion tons of sand is taken from the earth every year for homes, for skyscrapers, for infrastructure. But this raptures our natural world, eroding rivers, eroding coastlines. As demand for minerals and mines grows, the dredging goes on, damaging and degrading ecosystems distorting deltas and floodplains. We must use our sand wisely. We must rethink and recycle our building materials. We must reduce waste from mining. Let's use our rubble to build structures anew and build a circular economy where waste has value. Because without new thinking, the sands of time will run out. Now is the time to do. The Boundary Bay Coal-Fired Power Station in Saskatchewan, Canada has successfully captured over 90% of its flue gases since 2014. With new advanced technologies, this power station will capture even more, and hopefully all of them. Yet climate talks are based on the premise that coal is the worst emitter of CO2, the devil incarnate. The Boundary Bay Power Plant has paid the price, worked out the kinks, and has a wealth of knowledge and innovation to share with other countries. In conclusion, soil health and biodiversity depend upon responsible mining, whether that be for sand, coal, or lithium for electric vehicles, or silicon for our cell phones and our computers, and solar panels. As demonstrated, CCUS works with God's redemptive plan. Everything and everybody has a purpose, and no one or anything is trash, rubbish. Sand is essential for, bu for building our cities. Chief builders must get on board with the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Power Pass signator, signatories must change their assumptions about waste. Attitudes about brown coal must change. Brown coal is not dirty. It is a valuable kind of dirt. CCUS converts it to hydrogen for fuel and or humates to enhance the soil. CCUS technologies in the UK and in Addis Ababa prove that waste is valuable. In closing, I would like to leave you with this thought. Scientists have found a way to recycle CO2 and convert it back into solid coal. So perhaps at the next Ecofe or Saprej, I will develop that thought further. Until next time, thanks for your attention.